This is a reading of excerpts from William Bradford's Journal of Plymouth Plantation, read for Inspire Connections Academy. Excerpts from William Bradford's Journal of Plymouth Plantation, their safe arrival at Cape Cod. But to admit other things, that I may be brief, after long beating at sea, they fell with that land which is called Cape Cod, the which being made, and certainly known to be it, they were not a little joyful. Being thus arrived in a good harbor, and brought safe to land, they fell upon their knees and blessed the God of heaven who had brought them over the vast and furious ocean, and delivered them from all the perils and miseries thereof, again to set their feet on the firm and stable earth, their proper element." But here I cannot but stay and make a pause and stand half amazed at this poor people's present condition. And so I will think the reader, too, when he well considers the same. Being thus past the vast ocean and a sea of troubles before in their preparation, as may be remembered by that which went before, they had now no friends to welcome them, nor inns to entertain or refresh their weather-beaten bodies no houses, or much less town to repair to, to seek for succor. It is recorded in Scripture as a mercy to the ap Apostle and his shipwrecked company that the barbarians showed them no small kindness in refreshing them. But these savage barbarians, when they met with them, as after will appear, were readier to fill their sides full of arrows than otherwise. And for this season it was winter, and they that know the winters of that country know them to be sharp and violent and subject to cruel and fierce storms, dangerous to travel to known places, much more to search an unknown coast. Besides, what could they see but a hideous and desolate wilderness, fall of wild beasts and wild men, and what multitudes there might be of them they could not know? Neither could they, as it were, go up to the top of Pisgah to view from this wilderness a more goodly country to feed their hopes. For which way soever they turned their eyes, say upward to the heavens, they could have little solace or content in respect of any outward objects. For summer being done, all stands upon them which with a weather-beaten face and a whole country full of woods and thickets represented a wild and savage hue. If they looked behind them, there was the mighty ocean which they had passed and was now as a main bar and gulf to separate them from all the civil parts of the world. The First Encounter being thus arrived at Cape Cod, the 11th of November, and necessity calling them to look out a place for habitation, as well as the master and mariner's importunity, they, having brought a large shallop with them out of England, stowed in quarters in the ships, they now got her out and set their carpenters to work to trim her up. But being much bruised and shattered in the ship with foul weather, they saw she would be long in mending. After this, the shallop being got ready, they set out again for the better discovery of this place, and the master of the ship desired to go himself. So there went some thirty men, but found it to be no harbor for ships, but only for boats. There was also found two of the Indians' houses covered with mats and sundry of their implements in them, but the people were run away and could not be seen. Also there was found more of their corn, of their beans, and of various colors, and corn and beans they brought away, purposing to give the Indians full satisfaction when they should meet with any of them, as, about some six months afterwards, they did, to their good content. And here is to be noted a special providence of God, and a great mercy to this poor people, that here they got seed to plant them corn the next year, or else they might have starved, for they had none, nor any likelihood to get any till the season had been passed, as the sequel did manifest. Neither is it likely they had had this, if the voyage had not been made, for the ground was now all covered with snow and hard frozen, but the Lord is never wanting unto his in their greatest needs. 
He let his holy name have all the praise. The month of November being spent in these affairs and much foul weather falling in, the 6th of December they sent out their shallop again with ten of their principal men and some seamen upon further discovery, intending to circulate that deep bay of Cape Cod. The weather was very cold, and it froze so hard as the spray of the sea lighting on their coats, they were as if they had been glazed. The next night they landed and made them a barricado, as usually they did every night. With logs, stakes, and thick pine boughs, the height of a man leaving it open to leeward, partly to shelter them from the cold and wind, making their fire in the middle and lying round about it and partly to defend them from any sudden assaults of the savages, if they should surround them. So being very weary, they betook them to rest. But about midnight they heard a hideous and great cry, and their sentinel called, Arm! Arm! So they bestirred them and stood to their arms and shot off a couple of muskets, and then the noise ceased. They concluded it was a company of wolves or such like wild beasts, for one of the seamen told them he had often heard of such noise in Newfoundland. So they rested till about five of the clock in the morning, for the tide and their purpose to go from thence made them stirring betimes. So after prayer they prepared for breakfast, and it being day dawning, it was thought best to be carrying things down to the boat. But some said it was not best to carry the arms down. Others said that they would be the readier, for they had lapped them up in their coats from the dew. But some three or four would not carry theirs till they went themselves. Yet, as it fell out, the water being not high enough, they laid them down on the bank side and came up to breakfast. But presently, all on the sudden, they heard a great and strange cry, which they knew to be the same voices they had heard in the night, though they varied their notes. And one of their company, being abroad, came running in and cried, Men! Indians! Indians! And with all their arrows came flying amongst them. Their men ran with all speed to recover their arms, as by the good providence of God they did. In the meantime, of those that were ready, two muskets were discharged at them, and two more stood ready in the entrance of their rendezvous, but were commanded not to shoot till they could take full aim at them. And the other two charged again with all speed, for they were only four had arms there, and defended the barricado, which was first assaulted. The cry of the Indians was dreadful, especially when they saw the men ran out of the rendezvous toward the shallop to recover their arms, the Indians wheeling about upon them, but some running out with coats of mail on and cutlasses in their hands, they soon got their arms and let fly amongst them and quickly stopped their violence. Thus it pleased God to vanquish their enemies and give them deliverance, and by his special providence so to dispose that not any one of them were either hurt or hit, though their arrows came close by them and on every side of them, and sundry of their coats, which hung up on the barricado, were shot through and through. Afterwards they gave God solemn thanks and praise for their deliverance, and gathered up a bundle of their arrows and set them into England afterward by the master of the ship, and called that place the first encounter. The Starving Time but that which was most sad and lamentable was that in two or three months' time half of their company died, especially in January and February, being the depth of winter, and wanting houses and other comforts, being infected with the scurvy and other diseases which this long voyage and its inaccommodate conditions had brought upon them. So as there died some two or three of a day in the foresaid time, that of a hundred and odd persons, scarcely fifty remained. And of these, in the time of most distress, there was but six or seven persons who, to their great accommodations, be it spoken, spared no pains night nor day, but with the abundance of toil and hazard of their own health, fetched them wood, made them fires, dressed them meat, made their beds, washed their loathsome clothes, clothed and unclothed them. In a word, did all the homely and necessary offices for them which dainty and queasy stomachs cannot endure to hear named, and all this willingly and cheerfully, without any grudging in the least, 
showing here and there true love unto their friends and brethren, a rare example and worthy to be remembered. Two of these seven were Mr. William Brewster, their reverend elder, and Miles Standish, their captain and military commander, unto whom myself and many others were much beholden in our low and sick condition. And yet the Lord so upheld these persons as in the general calamity, they were not at all infected either with sickness or lameness. INDIAN RELATIONS All this while the Indians came skulking about them, and would sometimes show themselves aloof off, but when any approached near them, they would run away, and once they stole away their tools where they had been at work and were gone into dinner. But about the 16th of March, a certain Indian came boldly amongst them and spoke to them in broken English, which they could well understand but marveled at it. At length they understood by discourse with him that he was not of these parts, but belonged to the eastern parts where some English ships came to fish with whom he was acquainted and could name sundry of them by their names, amongst whom he had got his language. He became profitable to them in acquainting them with many things concerning the state of the country in the east parts where he lived, which was afterwards profitable unto them, as also of the people here, of their names, number, and strength, of their situation and distance from this place, and who was chief amongst them. His name was Samoset. He told them also of another Indian, whose name was Squanto, a native of this place, who had been in England and could speak better English than himself. Being after some time of entertainment and gifts dismissed, a while after he came again, and five more with him, and they brought again all the tools that were stolen away before, and made way for the coming of their great Sachem, called Massoset who, after four or five days after, came with the chief of his friends and other attendants with the aforesaid Squanto, with whom, after friendly entertainment and some gifts given him, they made a peace with him, which hath now continued this twenty-four years, in these terms. 1. That neither he nor any of his should injure or do hurt to any of their people. 2 that if any of his did hurt any of theirs, he should send the offender that they might punish him. 3. That if anything were taken away from any of theirs, he should cause it to be restored, and they should do the like to his. 4. If any did unjustly war against him, they would aid him. If any did war against them, he should aid them. 5. He should send to his neighbors confederates to certify them of this, that they might not wrong them, but might be likewise comprised in the conditions of peace. 6. That when their men came to them, they should leave their bows and arrows behind them. After these things he returned to his place called Soams, some forty miles from the place. But Squanto continued with them, and was their interpreter, and was a special instrument sent of God for their good beyond their expectation. He directed them how to set their corn, where to take fish, and to procure other commodities, and was also their pilot to bring them to unknown places for their profit, and never left them till he died. First Thanksgiving, 1621 they began now to gather in the small harvest they had, and to fit up their houses and dwellings against winter, being all well recovered in health and strength, and had all things in good plenty. For as some were thus employed in affairs abroad, others were exercising and fishing about cod and bass and other fish, of which they took good store, of which every family had their portion. All the summer there was no want, and now began to come in store of fowl as winter approached, of which this place did abound when they came first, but afterwards decreased by degree. And besides waterfowl there was a great store of wild turkeys, of which they took many, besides venison, etc. Besides, they had about a peck of meal a week to a person, or now, since harvest, Indian corn to the proportion which made many afterwards write so largely of their plenty here to their friends in England, which were not feigned but true reports. 